What is the most disturbing true crime story you know? Oh, you know, the guy who consensually fried and ate a guy's D with him, let him bleed out and ate more of him. Mary Vincent. Total badass but horrifying survival story. Mary was 15 years old I think. Hitchhiking in California hoping to get back home. Picked up by a pose who then raped her and cut off both of her arms and shoved her down a cliff. Mary ducking shoved her cut off arms into the mud to stop them from bleeding and hiked for hours and miles to the freeway. We're AI more to the story but that is the basics. Mary is a warrior. The greatest serial killer from Brazil. Pedrinho Matador. Allegedly murdered more than 100 people. 47 of them while in jail. One of them was, for example, his own father. That was also arrested for killing his mother. He also ate his father's heart at the occasion. Once, he was in the cell with another murderer. Famous for raping his cellmate, Pedrinho, afraid of being raped, killed the guy at the first day. Edit, I used the greatest in the bad way, like the worst, the most prolific, the most infamous or the one who killed more people. The murder of Jamie Bulger a two year old boy from Kirkby, Merseyside, England, who was abducted, tortured and killed by two 10 year old boys. Robert Thompson and John Venables. On Friday, the 12th of February 1993 they both got off likely as well and Venables was repeatedly arrested later in life for CP charges it is an offence in the UK to own or share a picture of these two or reveal any information about them. Viola Liazzo. She was a Michigan housewife who believed strongly in the civil rights movement. She left her family to march on Selma and shuttle African Americans to protests in the polls. She was murdered by a carload of KKK members for betraying the race, one of which turned out to be an FBI informant. In order to shield the informant from guilt, the FBI spent the next 20 years putting out misinformation about her case and her death, going as far as to call her a prostitute, drug addict, and even a communist in the middle of the Red Scare. In reality, she was a devout Catholic and mother of five who had the audacity to think that equality was something worth fighting for. Just got done reading Bodies in Barrels, The Snowtown Murders. Long story short, John Bunting, and with the help of a few friends, tortured, killed, and dismembered 11 people, putting their bodies in large plastic barrels and keeping them for years. By the end he had run out of room for them so he rented an old bank and stored the barrels in the vault. John Bunting had no sense of smell, so he got caught when the stench eventually got so bad it permeated through vault and neighbors complained. Apparently he enjoyed stirring up the decomposing human soup. I left out a lot of details but you should totally read the book it's pretty good and pretty ducked up. I don't remember the name but I listened to a podcast about a hitchhiker getting kidnapped. But she managed to escape and the police would not believe she got kidnapped. Finally they pick up the guy on an unrelated charge and he just starts confessing. Turns out not only did he kidnap her, he had murdered a number of people but with no consistent style so no one had even linked the murders. It really makes you wonder if there's prolific serial killers out there that just don't follow any patterns. Edit. Please help me find the name. It's been bugging me. I think the victim also made YouTube videos on how to escape a kidnapping. Peter Scully. He is an Australian who fled to the Philippines and operated a secreted arc web illegal material website known as No Limits Fun, NLF, where he and others raped and murdered children and babies. Arthi produced videos such as Sardesi's destruction which is so extreme that it was for some time regarded as an urban legend. Uh, it features the torture and brutal abuse of a number of girls by Scully and some Filipina accomplices. The three main victims were Liza, age 12, Cindy, 11, and Daisy, 18 months, Margaret A. Cullo, then project coordinator for the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimea and an expert on child abuse investigations, R. described the case as horrific and the worst she had ever heard of. His crimes were deemed so severe that some prosecutors supported the reintroduction of 30th penalty as punishment for Scully. R. Despite the fact capital punishment has been abolished in the Philippines since 2006, it still gives me the chills just thinking about it. Toy box killer. It's brutal. There was a case that was the opposite of Ken McElroy, the bully who got murdered in front of dozens of witnesses and no one saw anything. 
This other case involved several bullies who targeted two brothers constantly and ended with the bullies kidnapping and beating them in front of witnesses. That escalated to the brothers being tied up, tossed in the back of a pickup truck and paraded around town before they were eventually shot. None of the witnesses called the police even though the final incident went on for several days. Asterisk. My mom tells a story about her aunt and uncle having their home invaded. So it was a group of guys who'd escaped prison and were high and trying to hide out. They also wanted money to get more drugs supposedly. They broke into their house and duct taped them to chairs then pumped them full of drugs. My great uncle escaped but couldn't get his wife out of their burning home so she probably wasn't dead when the fire started and probably just couldn't escape like my great uncle did. He was horribly disfigured from the fire and obviously mentally scarred by not being able to rescue his wife from the fire. I cannot find articles about the incident as it happened in a small town back in 1994 but if anyone knows about a prison break in 94 in rural New Mexico then it's potentially connected. The guy who did it and got out of prison was in a video about a rehabilitation job where ex-con sell donuts. My mom saw him and started freaking out rightfully. Which is why I heard the story the first time. I think as it's a pretty ducked up true crime story that hits close to home. I also can't remember the video where the one dude got out of prison but if I shared that video his name would be attached to the story and I don't feel comfortable doing that anyway. Edit I asked if she could recount the story and it turns out I forgot some details that I fixed in the second paragraph. Pretty recent. I found this extremely disturbing. If by true crime you mean like a crime that happened. A few years ago I worked at a call center and one guy on my team who was probably 40ish started talking to me and the other guys who were all early 20s about Call of Duty. Well, turns out he and I are both into guns too. I'm like hell yeah I just made a friend. So he invites me to his house to shoot one day and like we kicked it man just had a friendly day. So a few weeks of working together he asks where I live and when I tell him he tells me his parents used to live down the street. I asked if they moved and he dead ass tells me this story. His perspective. My parents lived about a mile or two down from you. They didn't move what happened was my sister and her boyfriend wanted money so they killed my mother in her sleep and waited for my father to come home and shot and killed him. They tried to bury one and burn the other but were unsuccessful and got caught. My sister is actually up for parole next year but her BF is doing life. They had an episode of some armed crime show on it a few years ago when it happened. Holy it yo. I was weirded the duck out of that. Magdalena Solas. The High Priestess of Blood. In 1963. Brothers Santos and Caetano Hernandez. A pair of petty criminals. Devise a scam to swindle the population of the small farming town of Yerba Buna. They proclaimed themselves high priests of the old Inca gods and that they would bring bountiful harvests and treasure to the town in exchange for donations. Food and sometimes six. When the harvest and treasures failed to turn up the villagers began to grow angry and suspicious. So the brothers went to Monterey in search of a prostitute they could pay to act the part of a goddess in the farce. And made contact with Magdalena. What no one counted on was that Magdalena was insane and would quickly come to believe that she was indeed the priestess of the blood god. Only days after her arrival, Magdalena took over the cult and sacrificed two of the townsfolk. More human sacrifices followed and Magdalena began to drink the blood of the victims. She forced the Hernandez brothers to drink too and soon they came to believe that she really was the awakened Inca god Kotlaku. For 6 weeks straight they butchered and consumed victims with the surviving townsfolk sharing in the feast and blood orgies that followed. Only Magdalena was allowed to eat the hearts of the victims. In the middle of May, a 14 year old kid named Sebastian Guerrero from a neighboring town investigated the weird fires and shouting coming from the cavern temple and saw dozens of people near naked, covered in blood, cutting themselves and eating the flesh of corpses impaled on pikes and scattered around the altars. On foot. He ran over 25 kilometers to the nearest police station and reported what he'd seen. The police did not take him seriously, but sent officer Luis Martinez to take him back to the scene to make sure nothing was going on, and then drive him home. Neither of them were ever seen alive again. When officer Martinez didn't come back, the rest of the police force called in backup from several local towns and went in force to the caves. Upon arrival they were attacked by the cultists who had somehow attained obsidian knives and blades. Despite their ferocity, 
the officers managed gun down most of them and were able to arrest what remained. They found the boy, Sebastian, dead on an altar. His heart had been eaten. The officer had been dismembered and one of the Hernandez brothers had also been mutilated and partially eaten. Solis, her remaining priests and 12 of the townsfolk were brought to trial on the 13th of June, 1963. Each of them received a prison sentence of 30 years. Except Solis who was sentenced to 50 years in prison. Solis still lives to this day. She has never recanted her belief that she is the avatar of Kotlaku, the blood god. My parents grew up in Colombia during the drug wars of the 80s. My dad's brother who was 19 at the time went out on a first date with a girl and a few hours later. Family realized he didn't come back. The situation in Colombia was so tense at the time. If somebody was late, many people already started to assume the worst. After two days of not hearing from him after reporting to the police and getting nothing. My dad decided to drive to this river outside the city where many drug cartels dumped bodies. He found his brother's decomposing body along with the girl he went with. Turns out a friend of the girl he went with, who was also with them at the date, confessed that the three of them got kidnapped by the main girl's jealous ex-boyfriend, who had recently become a member of the cartels. He took them all into the mountains, castrated them all, then shot both my uncle and his date in the head. After that they dumped their bodies, and somehow the girl they went with got to escape and told the story days later on the news. Sadly, this is one of the hundreds of stories everybody who grew up in Colombia in the 80s knows. The Shannon Watts case. It was horrible. Kept me awake for several nights trying to understand how someone could do something so wicked to his own family. I still don't understand. We will probably never know. The Sitagaya murderer. He enters the house, slaughter the whole family, chills at their home after that eating ice cream and pooping. It was never solved. When I was pregnant with my youngest my midwife was forced off the road, attacked and murdered on her way home from delivering a baby. When the suspect was finally arrested, he lived close enough to us that I could see the back of his house from my front porch. That haunted me for a long time. Carla Homolka, part of the Ken and Barbie colors. Her husband was sick but I am deeply disturbed that she would participate in the drugging, rape, and murder of her own younger sister. Disgusting. And she had a very light sentence. Junko Furuta. I'm not going to describe it. Just look it up yourself. My neighbor was a famous restaurant owner. It was a huge story she conspired with her boyfriend to kill her husband. She bought him a motorcycle and he used it to commit the drive-by shooting. They both went to jail, but she ended up getting out after some time because of an appeal or something. It's always weird knowing right next door is a wealthy woman who killed her own husband. Well this happened around 2014-2015 if I remember correctly here in Switzerland. I find it especially disturbing, since it was right about two villages away from where I live and many people knew the victim personally. Also you never hear a story like this in Switzerland. It started with a news article about a house burning down. And I remember a friend in my class telling me it's the house of his friend and both their families were really close for years. A day later, when they managed to put the fire down, they discovered five corpses inside. Turns out, a guy held them hostage in their own house and would compel the mother to withdraw a lot of money. Later the security footages were released in which you could see how nervous and traumatized she looked. He ended up stealing around 10 feet 000 SFR. Worst part is, it was a whole family. The mother, three sons, age 9, 13 and 17, and the girlfriend of the oldest brother. Orthopsies later have shown that the three sons have been raped multiple times, probably in front of the other's eyes. The offender wasn't caught until two years later in the middle of the city with weapons and stuff to torture people. Really horrible story. I remember my friend's mom mourning and sobbing for days. Edit. I searched the case up and it didn't went down exactly. As I remembered. Apparently it is one of the most notable crimes in Swiss history. Anyway here is the article if you're interested. Repersal murder case. Tsutomu Miyazaki. Better known as the Otaku killer was a cannibal. Child rapist and necrophile who murdered four young girls. He would write to the families of his victims telling them how he killed their daughters. 
To sum up one of the murders a 4 year old girl vanished while playing with her friend. Miyazaki had laid her under a bridge where they had a conversation that lasted half an hour. He then murdered her where he then proceeded to have sex with her corpse. He then dumped her body in the hills near his home. He took her clothes with him. He let her body decompose. After that he came back to remove her hands and feet which he kept in his closet. He burned her remaining bones. Made it into powder. And sent it to her family. He also sent the family several of her teeth and pictures of her clothes and a postcard. It is a horrible case and it nearly made me cry. If you want another terrible case look up Orm Shin Rikayo. I was a male clerk in a military criminal investigations headquarters. We got case files from air bases from all over. It was a boring job and we would read the cases to pass the time. One came in from the Philippines. An air force woman was in town sightseeing and an air force man from her organization met her on the street. He put a gun in her ribs and make her go with him to a hotel. He spent the next couple of days raping her in all possible ways. He used and opened bottles on her and twice went down on the street and brought back groups of men to, to have sex with her. There were other things but, they have slipped my mind. He finally took her out and on the street she managed to get away and ran to a cop very close by. He got 20 years in prison and the rumor was he did 3 years. Got paroled and was supposed to have raped and killed. Read a book titled I Have Life about a young lady in South Africa who was kidnapped, raped for hours, stabbed, almost decapitated and left for dead. She explains how she walked from the pull off area to the road so she could get help, and suddenly couldn't see. It ended up being that her head was dislodging from its normal position and she had to hold her head sign with one hand while holding her intestines with the other. Says what kept her going was the thought her family would know by the blood that she suffered. Humans are tough and there are some ducking monsters out there. Jodi Arias. Very disturbing case. She was meant to go on a business trip with her boyfriend, maybe ex at the time, to Cancun. However he asked to change his travel companion to a female friend instead. Therefore she murdered him by stabbing him 28 times. Slicing his throat from ear to ear then shooting him in the left cheek. Then proceeded to travel across state right after to her ex-boyfriend for a hookup. Her defense in the trail was labeling him as a control freak, abuser, and child pedophile and that she had to shoot him in self defense when he lunged at her pathological liar and she still lies about the incident now while she is serving life in prison. The toolbox killers. They recorded on tapes the sounds of them torturing their victims. The tapes have never been released to the public. But snippets of them could be heard on old news recordings of the day they played them in court. The tapes were so emotionally jarring people got up and walked out of the courtroom. Many of which were in tears. Jurors were even putting papers up in front of their faces to hide their tears. I think I also heard that the FBI used to play the tapes for new agents so they could get a grasp on some of the awful things they'd see here during their careers. Of all the awful it I've ever seen on the internet. This got to me the most. Truly awful. I'm sure some may go look for the old news videos. But I strongly, strongly caution everyone with looking up transcripts of the tapes. Charles Kennedy. A frontiersman living outside Elizabethtown NN with his youth wife and child. After the conclusion of the Civil War they set up a rest stop for travelers. Charles would register guests into the rest stop maybe feed them some stew. Then he would kill them and either burn or bury their bodies. In 1870 during a meal a traveler asked if many Indians were in the area and Charles' son replied can't you smell the one papa put under the floor? Well Charles went on a rampage and went on to kill both the traveler and his own son and he buried both of them under the floorboards. He locked his hysterical wife in the house and left. She eventually escaped through the chimney and ran 15 miles to town to get help. Gunfighter Clay Allison and a posse found Kennedy and threw him in jail. However when there were rumors that Kennedy's lawyer was going to buy his freedom it so disgusted the citizens that Clay Allison tied a rope around Charles neck and had him dragged by horses to his death. He was one of my best friends in high school. This one never gets mentioned in these threads. Several kids were kidnapped and murdered in 1976-77 in Michigan. The murderer would dress their bodies very nicely with freshly ironed clothes. And then display their bodies like trophies in easy to spot locations or sometimes right in front of a police station. When one boy was kidnapped. His mom was interviewed. She was an emotional wreck. 
obviously, and said she wanted her son back just so she could take him to get his favorite meal saw Kentucky Fried Chicken. Several days pass and the boy is found, dead, displayed as a trophy with clean clothes and his belongings neatly placed beside him. When an autopsy was performed, they recorded the contents in his stomach. It was Kentucky Fried Chicken. The killer has never been identified or caught. Murder of James Bulger makes me sick. It's hard to choose because honestly I listen to watch so much true crimes are some of the most heartbreaking are when parents torture abuse neglect their children to death. Then they dispose of the bodies in trash cans. With fire. ETC. One of the worst was the case of Adrian Jones who was tortured to death and then had his body fed to pigs by his parents. The sheer number of these cases so in Southern California alone so is disheartening. But a few non-family murders that stand out. The murder of Cherish Periwinkle Sosh was the little girl whose mother was conned into thinking an older helpful gentleman wanted to give her a Walmart gift card to buy clothes for her daughter. So they shopped together for hours. There is so much surveillance video of them walking around the store. It's just so sad. Eventually he took the little girl for hamburgers at McDonald's so he passed by the one in the store. Took her to his van which had most of its seats removed. And then raped and murdered her. I have a very strong stomach for grisly crime but the testimony of the medical examiner in this case stained my spirit it was so awful. Austin sick murdering and dismembering Jessica Ridgway. This one is famous online for the recording in which Austin's mother calls 911 because her son has confessed to killing the girl and still having some of her remains in various places around the house. A torso had already been found. Austin himself gets on the phone and talks to the 911 operator. He and his mother get frustrated by how many questions she asks. The trial in this one also has stomach churning elements. Austin was well on his way to becoming a serial killer. The sexual torture murders committed and videotaped by Charles N.G. and Leonard Lake. Just google this story. It's horrifying. Similarly the toolbox murders committed by Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris in their murder Mac. They made audio recordings of themselves torturing, raping, and killing their female victims in brutal ways. That audio was played during the trial and it was devastating and brutal for everyone so except the killer Sutter here. Finally I would say the Wichita massacre committed by the Carr brothers is desperately sad. They broke into an apartment where some friends were hanging out and subjected them to a horrifying night of torture and abuse before killing them. I'm pasting some of the details from the Wikipedia page about this case because if I paraphrase no one will believe the ending. On the 14th of December, the brothers broke into a house at 12,727 E. Birchwood Drive in Wichita, inside the property, which they had chosen at random. Brad Haker, Heather Muller, Aaron Sander, Jason Beffert and his girlfriend, a young woman identified as Holly G. Beffert was a local high school teacher. Haker was a director of finance with a local financial services company. Muller was a local preschool teacher. Sander a former financial analyst who had been studying to become a priest. Holly G. was a teacher. 5. First the cars searched the house for valuables. Beffert had intended to propose to Holly. And she found this out when the cars discovered an engagement ring hidden in a popcorn box. After burgling the house, the cars forced their victims to strip naked and then bound them. They then repeatedly raped the two women. And forced the men to engage in sexual acts with the women and the women with each other. After taking the victims in Beffert's truck to ATMs to empty their bank accounts. They drove them to the closed striker soccer complex on the outskirts of Wichita where they shot all five execution style in the back of their heads. The cars then drove Beffert's truck over their bodies and left them for dead. Holly G. survived because her plastic barrette deflected the bullet to the side of her head. She walked naked for more than a mile in freezing weather to seek first aid and shelter at a house. Before getting medical treatment, she reported the incident and descriptions of her attackers to the couple who took her in. Before the police arrived. The mayor of Lanet, Alabama murdered his teacher wife over her land inheritance. Full stop. The Chris Watts murders. There are more. Like Andrea Yates, Scott Peterson, Casey Anthony, Sylvia Luggins, Jamie Bulger, and the list goes on. I heard about Mary Vincent when I was like 5 and it has always stuck with me. After being raped, having her arms cut off, and thrown over a cliff, she managed to rescue herself. 
her attacker was released on parole only 8 years after this. Apparently he later murdered another woman. Luckily, he died in prison, so can never be released upon society ever again. One of my grandaddy's brothers, his girlfriend, and another friend was killed by the mafia. They were into hard drugs after World War II. They sold heroin and ran a shooting parlor in their house. They got caught skimming because they were cutting the product to sell a little extra on the side. They were made examples and stabbed so many times with ice picks the cops thought they were killed with a shotgun. It was the late 40s early 50s near Danville, VA. All of granddaddy's people were shady and so was granddaddy. He had a second family for a while. I've never met them but I have couple of aunts and a bunch of cousins I'll probably never meet. Jeffrey Dahmer has to be on the list. A little girl was tortured, starved, shot with pallet guns, made to eat vomit and dismembered. The only reason anything was found out was because the house those two monsters were living in got a new tenant who noticed a horrid stench. They found parts of her in a wall, and the rest of her was dumped in a shallow grave in the vicinity of a garbage dump. Futoshi Matsunaga, Japan's brainwash killer. That lady in Alabama who became jealous of another lady's pregnancy, killed her, cut out the baby and ran. I used to date a girl who knew the killer before it happened. Has to be Dharma, strictly because of how close I found myself to his family. Now that I have your attention, my best friend in high school had a nice older brother, we live in Ontario, Canada. He is about 3 years older than us. He dated a girl in high school and I remember her. She seemed nice but, off, they dated for all of high school and then he ended it when he left for college. He ended up having to come back from his first semester in college because he was told by his mom that the ex was not doing well and had been committed soon after they broke up. She had cut herself a lot, cut his name, had books full of his name and was nearly catatonic in hospital. The older brother is a caring person so he visited her. When he gave her name they had trouble finding her in the records. It was then that he was taken aside by the intake nurse who explained that the reason they couldn't find her was because she had gone by her first and middle name and omitted her last name. That her name is actually Dharma and she is Jeffrey Dharma's niece. When he told me about this he remembered the last name showing up on their home caller ID as Dharma but he never made the connection and figured the name he knew her by was her mother's maiden name. Dharma's parents forgave him and stayed in their hometown. His brother on the other hand was disgusted and moved illegally to Canada with just his only daughter. Apparently when you live illegally in Canada, it is ill advised to try to have your last name changed. The home phone was associated to his credit score and therefore was listed as Dharma. The brother said goodbye to her and moved away to college finally. The story of the world's youngest serial killer, Amojit Sada. I don't remember everything but he lived in a town in India where I believe about half of the population were his extended relatives. He killed two younger children in his family and the family kept it on the DL. Until he killed someone outside of his family. When one of his aunts, I think, brought the parent of the third child to Imojit and said he had killed them. He was arrested at 8 years old. Who's that serial killer that turned people's skin into furniture? That one. H.H. Holmes and his booby-trapped hotel. Tico Adams, who was 7 months pregnant, was lured to an apartment under the pretense of free baby clothes. She was held captive for 3 days, beaten and the woman tried to cut the baby out of her. To escape, Tika had to step over the sleeping woman. She made a noise and was dripping blood onto her but she didn't wake up and had to hold her intestines so they wouldn't fall out. It was so bad that I think the EMT passed out on the scene. Tika Adams and her baby survived. Oss my mom is an attorney and this one story has always stuck out. She had a case where these parents killed their kids stuffed them in plastic totes. Put the totes into a storage locker and then left for vacation. Like WTF man. It'll probably never get read. But this is one question I feel like I finally have a great answer for. The murders of Amy Hensley and Tonya Howarth. Amy's son was a year above me in school, and her husband was my wrestling coach. From her being reported missing to their bodies being found in the investigation, there's actual an episode on the case on the ID channel. The Jeff Davis 8. Over 4 years, 8 women were found dead in rural Louisiana. They all knew each other. 
likely to never be publicly solved because members of law enforcement are involved and further witnesses are too afraid to talk. Edit to add, the writer and creator of True Detective is a Louisiana native. But he claimed to have not heard of the Jeff Davis murders until after season 1 had been produced.